Guys, Drum Trainer Online, I can't tell you how excited I am. John J.R. Robinson in our studio. I'm so, I'm, I feel like a little teenager. I spent <laughs> so many hours, months of my life in my practice room playing to all those awesome records. I'm so fucking excited. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> so Thanks, great Jared. to have you, John. It's, it's good to be here, man. It's my pleasure. <laughs> it really, it's a, it's a dream come true. And I have a lot of questions. I put a lot into my um, a computer and I will ask you a lot of uh, questions. So this is going to be a long one, okay? JR, you come from Iowa. Yes. So, so tell us something about your, your childhood. How, how did you get into drumming? You know, I, uh, I had very uh, great uh, parents, Jack and Helen, and uh, my, my father played violin and was a vocal arranger, and, um, but he was also a doctor and right. a piano player. So he started being playing on piano at age five. And, and uh, during all that time, I'm listening to my mother's records with my mother, and she's playing all the swing music. And, and she goes, that's Gene Krupa, you know, that's Buddy Rich. And oh, I love drums, I love drums. And so I finally got a drum set between age seven and eight, and, right. uh, and, and then the rest is history. I formed a band at age 10, and we got our first paying gig, and, and that just kind of kept morphing into bigger and larger bands and stuff. So it was just kind of a, I, I made that decision at age 10. All right, so that, that was when you made your first money, and uh, was that kind of motivation too? Like, hey, I make some money with that? It was definitely a perk. I mean, right. you know, we didn't need the money. We, we, right. I mean, everybody needs some money, but we didn't want the money. We just wanted to go play. Right. You know, and then when, when you get older, you know, a little older, and you realize, wow, yeah, I can make money in doing this? This is cool. Right. So, and, and, and I guess you played in cover bands then, oh, you, yeah. you covered stuff. So, do you think that helped you to become the musician you are, to, to, to cover tunes of other people? Yeah. And I mean, in, in my day, I guess, of cover bands, um, and I assume this goes all the way back to the jazz drummers. They were right. probably doing covers all the right. time. And, uh, but you learn a specific song from the way it was recorded. And then the, you, you plug your style into that song. You can't emulate exactly what that drummer did, right. uh, but you you make yourself that drummer. But you it, then it becomes it's. We always say, uh, play it like you own it. Right. Okay, and um, uh, you were talking about swing music. This is what I thought is interesting. You said that before at some clinics here in Berlin and in Dresden that that you think like the 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 swing that that makes a, uh, the swing feel is what makes a, a, a drummer feel good or, or groove, is that right? Like, I, would I you compare so. that to, 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 to nowadays groove if people put some swing into it? I think so, and you know, music has obviously changed, and with machines or humans trying to program swing, uh, you know, quantizations, it's, it's man-made swing. Right. So there's nothing better than human swing. And then, you know, whether you're playing straight eighths or not, it still has a swing to it. Right. So that, that um, of course, you could uh, see that in a lot of, lot of stuff you did. So, okay, that was your childhood, and then you went to, to study with, I think, Ed Sof, too? I studied with Ed Sof. I was still in high school, All right. early high school, and I'd go to summer camps, and that's where I met Ed Sof. And, you know, I, I met Gary Burton and uh, Marion McPartland and John Laporta and all these really cool cats. And, but Ed Sof was uh, instrumental because I was little, I started playing drums and started to play with Heel Up. And Ed Sof got, got me into the thinking concept of playing Heel Down and releasing the beater off the head. So that was instrumental in me formulating my time concept. Right. You know. so, so for the people who don't know Ed Sof, he was the uh, leader of the drum department of the North Texas State University yep. for ages, wasn't he? Like, yep. so a lot of great people started with them, uh, Keith Carlock, Steve Howden, a lot of people. And then from, from um, like after you graduated from high school, you went straight to Berkeley. I moved to Boston, you know, from Iowa, farmland to Boston. You know, it was a culture shock. Right. And uh, went right in. I stayed in college for three straight years. So and tried to get as much information out as possible. Practicing all day, playing in bed. Not all day. I was, you know, I'd practice uh, the essential practicing, and um, uh, you know, practice always in the room too. But um, you know, now nowadays Berkeley is really advanced and right. grown. And when I was there, it was pretty um, old school, as right. we must say. So you know, so at Berkeley, we 
we, we learned, um, it was a whole other culture shock for me, you know, getting thrust in there with all these players from around the world. Right. And my first year I studied with a drummer named Dave Vos, but I wasn't really getting that drum set crave. So I got with Alan Dawson, and Alan Dawson was just, oh my God, it was fantastic. He was so musical. And I got six good months in with him. All right. And that was wonderful. I mean, he, he was very, very staunch, regimental, but yet still had this beautiful fluidity and swing concept to his uh, teaching and playing. So that was straight ahead jazz, a lot of syncopa was syncopation book was around uh, yep. already, the Bible. Yep, the Bible, syncopation. Right. And a lot of big band uh, stuff too, so you... Yeah, from, yeah, at Berkeley, yeah, we had a, uh, I was in several big bands, I was in a, a small quintets. I had a jazz Miles clone band called Balls, B-A-L-Z, and uh, I don't know what happened to those guys, and, um, and I was in a, first time I was ever in a 60-piece band, we played uh, at some uh, John Hancock Hall, and... But I had a whole bunch of rock bands, pop bands. I was in a Tower Power band for a while. Oh. And, um, you know, through through the years of now winning, I got out of Berkeley. I'm still working in Boston. But I'm getting frustrated, you know, like all of us are. And um, the, the whole convergence of our class, we're going to go to New York. Man, New York, we got to go to New York. Right. Um, I thought about it. And I auditioned for some band who had a record deal. And it was kind of folky. And I was like, ugh. I hate this music, so I, I, I'm glad I didn't get the gig. And uh, there was a funk band called Ellis Hall. This is great piano player who's blind uh, from Boston. It's not like Stevie, like a little more, it's like really funky cat. And uh, I got a call, because I was a singing drummer, and get a call that they need a drummer who's funky that can sing. So I didn't I'm, know that you you sang two backups. Oh yeah, oh yeah, a lot. And uh, I was an all-state singer in Iowa. All right. Singing uh, Basso Profundo and, and all the Brahms and stuff. Okay. But, um, so I drove to this audition, and this is no cell phones, and the car breaks down ten miles from where they were. So I go, shoot, what am I going to do, man? So I get out and walk to a payphone and call. And uh, I said, I can't get there. I'm broken down, I can't get there. And it's a good thing, because then I joined Rufus and Chaka Khan. Oh, really? So if I had joined the Ellis Hall band, I would have probably never joined Rufus <laughs> and Chaka Khan. So and how did that happen with, with uh, Rufus and Chaka Khan? It was cool. Khan? We had a band, an eight-piece band called Shelter. And uh, we ended up, we had an agent, and we, were, we left Massachusetts and toured Ohio. And just, just coincidentally, the band Rufus and Chaka Khan was touring Ohio and kind of in, the, in all the same cities, but we were playing clubs and they were playing big venues. And so one night they came into this club outside of Cleveland. Everybody straggled in and they, I saw them all sitting there because I knew who they were. And uh, one guy comes up and he goes, do you mind if we sit in with your drummer? And I looked at the leader and I go, yeah, I mean, let him, let him. So everybody starts getting all their on the other gear, and, and pretty soon we're we're playing, and then pretty soon Shaka comes up, man, and it's like, and we did a whole other set with just them. So it was new Rufus, and uh, I went down the next day and sat in with them at their sound check, and then they basically said, uh, "What are you doing in the next two weeks? Would you like to move to L.A.?" And I go, "Yeah." So I had to find somebody to sub for me, and. I went back to Boston, packed up, and drove to California. Four days. Uh, well, I stopped in Iowa for a second to oh, chill. Right. And then so that was 75 or what? 78. All right. 78. And so and, and after that comes history, but let's go back to, 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 uh, uh, for, to Iowa. You, you said you were singing in a choir. Oh, they used to sing in church. And, and, then, and, and, church and, and then high school, I'd, and mostly high school, I, I sang all... Uh, in the choir also. And would you say that that helped you uh, to become a better drummer? Like, did that help you to for your time? Would you say that? I'm not sure if that's true, but it, it can't hurt. Right. You know, but in all the rock bands, I always sang. Right. You know, I'd split it with the guitar player. You know, I'd sing uh, Crossroads. All right. And, uh, and things like that. But, you know, then, it, you know, and it's not hard for me to sing and play. Okay. Uh, it just comes natural. But... There's a point, like when I joined Rufus, where I didn't want to sing anymore. 
because Sh- Shaka Khan was singing. You know, <laughs> okay. I was like, uh, I don't know. I don't even want to think about it. The drumming was so intense. Right. So I, I chose to just be a drummer at that point. All right. So then you moved to Los Angeles and yeah. and you started recording right away. Or what, was that yeah. only the click track times? Or, or was it? Well, yeah, we were all clicked. Right. And we started recording with a Rufus solo record, and then and that was called Numbers on ABC Dunhill. Right. And in those days, ABC Dunhill was Steppenwolf, Steely Dan, The Crusaders, and Rufus. Right. And uh, little did I know that was the end of ABC Dunhill. Right. You know, because everybody scattered, and we went to MCA at that point. But we had done a solo record, and that was my first major record. Awesome, and, and and this is how you met Quincy Jones, I guess, through Rufus and Chaka Khan. Uh, and you know, actually, indirectly, I met Quincy through Mark Hartley and Larry Fitzgerald, our management. And it was at a, a concert in downtown Los Angeles, and I strategically was placed right by him, which was very interesting. And he uh, always liked guys from Berkeley because he always had cats in his band, uh, you know, through the years that had gone through Berkeley, and so did he right. in the old days. And uh, so. You know, basically, um, we heard then that Quincy was going to produce the Master Jam record, which was the Rufus Shaka Khan record on MCA, the first one, which was a very big record. And um, I go, great, man, Quincy's producing our record. This is fantastic. Got to know him and everything. You know, and right at the tail end of that record, it's done. And he asked me, do you do other records outside of Rufus? You know, because sometimes maybe a drummer may be insecure. Maybe he doesn't want to jump out of his wheelhouse. But... And I go, hell yeah, man. What, 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 when, let's go. So he goes, well, come down next Thursday and bring your drums and you're gonna uh, play on a song or two. I go, okay. So we didn't even have a cartridge company. So my roadie bear, we brought the kit in a little old truck and set up and uh, the first song I did was called Girlfriend by Paul McCartney. And these were the beginning of the Off the Wall record. Right. It was a real sound. I don't even remember the song. <laughs> and uh, and then it was, you go, all right, done. You want to do another one? I go, yeah. Now let's do It's the Falling in Love, which was Carol Bear Sager and David Foster, right. who I work with now. And I nailed that. And there was some time that went by, and, and then Quincy Persis, he goes, well, what are you doing Monday? And I go, nothing. He goes, well, would you like to come down and record the rest of the album? And I go, yeah. And so that I went came down, I was all excited that weekend, and. I came down, and that's where I met Greg Fullingains, and and we cut "Don't Stop Till You Get Enough," awesome. and then from there everything got getting scheduled to the next songs, "Off the Wall," and "Working Day and Night," and then "Rock with You," and and finishing that record. And I got to hang out through that whole record for six months and watch the process, not just drumming and guitar playing, but. The whole process. I was just about to say, you said that in the intensive training, like you, you would sit down with with Quincy and Michael Jackson and and, and and talk about tempos and how it would fit, or how 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 yeah. did you develop stuff like that? They they they, they basically put their trust in, in a 23, 24 year old, and said, you know, well, what do you think of this? What do, what do you think of that tempo? And I go, I don't know. I, I this one feels it just feels a little slow, right. or this feels a little fast, or this one is perfect. And so that you know, I'd use a seven-frame click, Yuri, and I'd I'd control the uh, the tempos before we would cut. And uh, you know, so there's extremely deliberation involved in figuring out. And this is way pro any digital, you know, when you think about how a song feels. But they insisted that it has to be done with a click track, right? Because they may want to edit. Of course. And, and this is what I read before and heard that you seem to have a like very natural um, uh, ability to play with the click because that wasn't uh, people were not used to that back in the days, were they? No, and I, I'm sure. I mean, you listen to a lot of records; they move, right. you know. And that's, I guess, you know, that's part of the magic of, of that. But, but you know, things changed, you know, in the in the late '70s, and that's all basically from film, and. Uh, You know, the majority of the stuff I've ever cut has been with a click track. And I, I became the drummer at Berkeley back in, you know, 74-ish probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, and learn, and I, I didn't know what a click track was. And they go, well, you're going to play this Thad Jones Mellow Lewis chart, and you're going to hear four clicks. I go, what's a click? Oh, it's, it's just a digital noise. <laughs> but it'll keep you in line. I go, okay, click, 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 da, bop, 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 whatever. And, uh, okay, next tune. 
and so I became the guy. So you nailed it. Yeah, it was like. And okay. you never trained that before. You were just able never to do heard it. one. Awesome. I didn't know what it was. You know, I mean, you know, we, we know what time is, and this is obviously very staunch, uh, perfect time. You know, no variations. Right. So. So let's talk about uh, off the wall again. I mean, epic record. One of my top three records. Uh, I mean, not just for me. I think it was one of the best records, of course, of the last century. So um, I'm a nerd about the um, uh, uh, fill into rock with you, of course. Right. So it's, um, could you explain, break that down just for us like uh, real quick? Because I think I always played it wrong. And so do a lot of people, <laughs> but good. Okay, do it from uh, with the, um, the camera from above, please. Okay, there we are. Do you want me to do it like a smooth jazz record? Oh, yeah. No, I'm not going to do that. So, you know, I basically used uh, 16th notes and, and triplets and syncopation. And then I wanted to create a hole that still, which allows people to go, bam. Right. So, what I, I didn't really believe in 16th notes and triplets together, you know. work together to me and uh, but I go let's do it anyway because okay. we wanted something different something that for everybody would forever remember so I just play one two mm. and there's a big hole there right and that hole is again for people to breathe and we get right into the thing right. Very simple groove, but it's got a sl it's straight sixteenth slightly swung, right. which then that means that your bass drum has to be slightly swung on the sixteenth note, getting into the next downbeat. All right. So and it's it's a four stroke rough, but you play you started with the right hand, don't you? Because that I always correct. thought he started. I always told my students he must have started it was with a left hand. I don't think I. I was amazed. Yeah. There's just, just one flame in the beginning. One flame. So, and of course, if you if you guys want to know that the transcription is on the oh. uh, right symbol, isn't it? You'll probably see that from above, eh? Yeah. <laughs> This was done by the great Johnny Douglas, who's uh, you know uh, Frank Beard's drum tech from ZZ, and he and uh, he's with uh, uh, Bon Jovi. All right. Uh, so, I wanted the transcription. You know, we have my my two rides. We have the transcription here on the 2002 Swish Ride, and we use the same one on, on the Master Series Deep Ride. But we want it made it artistic into an actual piece of vinyl. <laughs> What a concept. And it's called Signature Groove. So now, you know, if you look at it again, there we go. I don't know if you can dial in that. Oh, yeah, he's got it. Here we go. <laughs> Simple enough. Awesome. And, and I mean, you explained the song in your tutorial here on the platform. It's just like I always thought it was... It, it, you always played like not so much like other people would do. How how came that? Did did Quincy Jones uh, uh, tell you, or were you always like, oh, I hold myself back. I just play very simple. No, it was actually the opposite of that. But it actually happened before that two years when I joined Rufus. Uh, it was you know we were playing all live. There was hardly any studio work, and so and Billy Cobham was a huge influence in my life. Right. So I, you know there was always like. You know, a whole bunch of really busy fills right. and just frantic and you know tried to apply that but I I had good time so so when I got and got into the Rufus Bobby Watson the bass player said John don't play that shit <laughs> he goes I just want you to play boom bop boom bop that's all I want you to play don't play any of that other stuff I go really <laughs> you know, I was kind of a bit disappointed because I was like, oh, God, we're going to go past Mahavishnu. We're going to go past them, you know, <laughs> you know, like looking for that other planet to land right. on. And then I'm on this other planet, and there's a planet of funk. Right. And, uh, and then I go, whoa, wait a second. You start listening to the parts that, it, that they're playing, and, and then you, you come up with some sort of a signature beat or moment or... Like I, I said yesterday, I go, the last thing I want to hear is a drummer 
outside the song. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear him stand out. Right. I mean, you know, sure, a little thing now and then, but if I hear drums on a final mix, that, that I go, why, why am I hearing all these drums? They, they need to be felt. I don't care if it's heavy metal or whatever it is. They need to be felt within the scope of the song. Right. So uh, I, I try to, uh, you know, instow that in, in people. So, and then when I got with Quincy, I mean, started working with Quincy, he used to go, you know, we, we did... Uh, a whole bunch of records in a row, you know, with Master Jam and Off the Wall and Ernie Watts and Patty Austin, and uh, it just kept going and going and going. The Dude, which was multi, God, I don't know how many, four or five Grammys he won, and we toured off The Dude with a huge band with Greg Gaines and Lewis Johnson yeah. and Toots Thielman and really crazy, and Jerry Hay, and uh, we were in the Superdome in New Orleans, big arena, and it was right... 20 minutes before showtime, and Quincy grabs me and brings me out on the stage, and he points up to those people. He goes, Jay, see those people up there? And I thought he was pointing somebody out to me that I might know. He goes, they don't give a shit what you're playing on the hi-hat. <laughs> they don't care. And then he walked away. And I'm like, oh. And then it sunk in. You know, he didn't want any of that, Joe. He didn't want any of that crap. He just wanted them. wanted meat and potatoes. Because, right. you know, there were so many elements to the music. Why should I get in the way? Right. But I can lead it certain ways. So that was very interesting. Very, very interesting lesson. Interesting. And, of course, all th those records like Off the Wall and, of course, Thriller, those are, of course, dance floor records too. People, they, people would play it uh, in the clubs and they still do. So. Were you ever? Uh, did you ever go out and dance? Were you a dancer? When I you always were danced. Yeah, I always went out and danced. I mean, I'm, if I have time, I'll go out and dance. If you know, uh, find the right partner, right, and go dance. Sure, I love dancing. And um, and did you listen a lot to uh, the old R and B music like Motown and Stax? And, Absolutely, and all that? right. Listen, Motown and Stax, and ironically worked for Stax at the end. Oh, really? With with uh, with uh, Jim Stewart in Memphis, and uh, I was a young kid. Wayne Henderson got me that gig from the Crusaders. Very interesting. This is very interesting. And uh, uh, but I also, you know, listened to the big band. I listened to, you know, I was obviously a very classic rock guy. I right. love classic rock and roll. And um, like John Bonham. Yeah, and pre, and even pre pre Bonham, you know. Right. Um, there was a Peter whole, Richard stuff. Well, I wasn't really into that. Okay. I mean, I was, in, you know, sixty. 65, 6, 7, 8, and 9, and then when Zeppelin's hit started. Oh. So, and then, um, you know, I've got a really large record collection now. But vinyl, I, I, a vinyl nerd, you told me. Yeah, I'm a vinyl nerd, yeah. And, you know, they're going to need another house one day for all my records. So. <laughs> it's great. And when I see you play, and I think you even said that on the Dresden Drum Festival, it, it looks like you're moving always when, when you play the drums. Is that important for you to... to be moving to it, yeah, and, and if I'm not moving, that means that a I'm not I sh I'm not either interested or something's wrong. It's <laughs> it's really important in, in dance oriented groove, R and B rock. Right. You know, I mean, if you just listen to Van Halen, if you really listen to it, it's there's just they're just dance grooves. Right. That's all they are with l bigger guitars. Right. And um, awesome drummer, by the way, I have to say. Alex say Van Halen. Alex Van Halen. Always, I always thought he was a great drummer. I, I love Alex. Right. Alex is a fellow Pisces artist. Uh, he's just a badass drummer. But um, yeah, it's it's important. It's important to move. Right. And I was trying to show that yesterday. And uh, a lot of guys did it. Right. So the ones that don't move are the ones you got to worry about. <laughs> and another thing we were talking about, uh, 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 let's say, rock with you again. You start the, the, the chorus is with two hands on the hi-hat. You play it very soft, right. what I always thought, like very low volume. Right. And then in the verse, you go to the eighth notes. Right. And we were talking about that some colleagues uh, in a video back in the day said, oh, in R&B music, that's the R&B hi-hat rule. You always have to play compressed eighth notes. And I was always like... That's not true, because I, I was I was listening to stuff you did with Rufus and Shaka Khan, but also that stuff. But there, there's some kind of a movement between the the quarter note and the eighth note sometimes. Isn't that it? is correct. Yeah, I mean, and whomever would say that is basically doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> you know, so if if you were 
I, you know, always use this as a shank of the stick, and that's the bead. But and I mean, what they're saying is like that. So I mean, sure, I can make that funky. But if I do that same thing with using the shank tip method. You're working with Luther Vandross, God bless his soul. Right. Now that is just... Work for him too. No, uh, maybe once. Right. Yeah, maybe once. But, you know, this becomes really sterile unless it's it's exactly straight like right. that. And it depends on the music, of course. I mean, maybe in some Cool in the Gang stuff it would fit, but... Right, or, right. or Gap Band or... Right. Uh, or maybe Funkadelic, I mean, I don't, or, right. you know, uh, Parliament. You know, right. Dennis, but Dennis tended to I saw Dennis play do what some I'm fun doing. stuff like that, yep. too. And That's it, right. And you can't say he's not grooving. He's one hell of a groover. <laughs> Definitely. So let's go back to Off the Wall. Oh, yeah. and, and you, and, because I was always wondering, and don't uh, stop till you get enough, and ah. um, what was the other name? Where mm, we, I always he heard those overdubs, and I thought, it, that's not... Cowbells, right. they have to use beer bottles. I always told my stu students, oh man, I think those are beer bottles, overdubs. But I th you told us it were other bottles. They were wine bottles. And you played that with Michael Jackson uh, together. Working day and night. Yeah. Working day and I night. mean, they used it on uh, Don't Stop, but I didn't do it on that one. It was right. Palino. Okay. Uh, but we, uh, Working Day and Night was cut later. Right. Similar concept, a lot faster groove. Right. And uh, Michael and I would always. Oh yes, let's let's get some wine bottles. <laughs> and uh, okay, but they, they didn't want Bordeaux bottles. Right. They, they wanted like you know Ripple, right? Crap bottles. And so yeah, how about this one? Because they just a little more girth. So we brought some bottles in, and uh, the, the, the very interesting story was um, so you know the track's done, blah blah blah. blah we're we're layering it. So Bruce Swedeen goes, all right, all right, you two, get in there and. Uh, do your wine bottle overdub because we, we had been talking about it for weeks. And I think Qu or Bruce was already sick of us talking about it. So, <laughs> all right, so it sets up, a, I think, a dual pattern, maybe like that. And I'm over here, and Mike's here, and it's really ethereal. It's afternoon, and sun's shining in, and you know, I'm in a room with Michael Jackson playing overdubs. It's kind of cool, man. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm, I'm like doing uh, my part is like a. Like in Mozambique. Yeah. <coughs> Something. I don't know if it's even that advanced. Right. And I don't know what Mike's, Mike's going. Something like that. And we're doing it together and it's really cool. And you know, about a third of the way through the song, my wine bottle shatters all over my arm. <laughs> and I'm sweaty and, and uh, we stop, but the track keeps going. And Mike starts picking the glass out of my arm. And he goes, oh, JR. And it's really kind of weird. Uh, it's very surreal. I've got Michael Jackson picking glass out of my arm. <laughs> and then Bruce pushes and goes, hey, what are you guys doing in there? I go, well, my wine bottle broke. He goes, well, get another bottle. Let's finish the overdub. You know, and so that was, <laughs> that was the end of that story. But uh, Awesome. It was like, okay, not everybody can say Michael picked glass out of them. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I heard he's a good drummer. He was a good drummer, too. Michael. You know, and I never really saw him play drums. <coughs> but he played I, overdubs, I heard a lot. Like I that. don't doubt, because the way he could dance, mm -hmm. anybody that can dance like that can play drums. Yeah. You know?